Hello, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give the talk. Um, the topic, topic of my talk is balancing social distancing and care continuum and the role of telehealth and omen infusions. Here are my disclosures. The learning, learning outcomes of my talk are to recognize the terms digital health, telehealth, and telemedicine, discuss the benefits and challenges of using telehealth, review what is known on home therapy and LSD, share with you the impact of the COVID-19 on patients with Gaucher disease from the EWGGD data, and present, present the working in progress for digital health in Gaucher disease as a model for lysosomal storage diseases. To set the stage for my talk, I would like to start with definitions. Digital health is a broadest term. It means combining digital te technologies with health, healthcare, living, and society to enhance the efficiency of healthcare delivery and make medicine more personalized and precise. A subdomain of digital health is telehealth, which is a distribution of health-related services and information via telecommunication technologies. It allows low-distance low patient and clinical clinician contact, care, advice, reminders, education, intervention, and monitoring. Telemedicine is a subdomain of telehealth, referring specifically to remote clinical services. In my talk today, I will focus on the benefits and challenges of telehealth and telemedicine, using sometimes the terms interchangeably. Telehealth can be used in several ways. First, clinician to clinician communication through email, video, or both. Some examples are sending pictures of a rash to dermatologists, internet-based radiology meetings, and surgical peer monitoring. The second way is clinician to patient interaction. This also can be done by various tools like video, phone, email, internet, and remote, remote wireless monitoring. Examples include care of chronic conditions, medication management, counseling, and post-discharge follow-up. The third way is to use the remote patient's monitoring tools by mo mobile health technology, including wearable monitors, smartphones, mobile apps, etc. The aim of this tool is to capture patient-related outcome data that are not obtained during in-person care. Here you can see the types of technologies used in telemedicine. A real-time audio-video communication tool connects patients and physicians and patients in different locations using mobile health applications on a computer table or model, mobile device. Store and forward, forward or asynchronous technologies collect images and data that can be transmitted and interpret, interpreted later. One crucial component for the ability to perform user, useful telemedicine in times of social distancing is the ability to perform remote patient monitoring, as you can see here, including vital signs, blood and urine tests, physical examination, real-time oscillation with telemedicine compatible stethoscopes, besides bedside imaging like ultrasound, echocardiography, etc. Although much has been developed in this aspect, there is still a long way to go before we can rely on remote patient monitoring as part of home at, patient, at the patient home for all data needed. Mostly today, remote monitoring can be done in the local clinic and be communicated to the remote treating physicians. But as we saw, telehealth is more than just telemedicine. And there are other technologies that can be used in times of social distancing, but not only at these times, including tools for continuing medical education for patients, other, phys other physicians, students, nursing call centers for emergency care and issues that emerge at time of in-between clinic visits. Another arm of tele-earth health is providing abilities that can help perform clinical research remotely. This is especially important at time of social distancing. A report on the main barriers for telemedicine and telehealth development was published in 2017 as an EU communication. Although changes occurred since 2017, and even more now at the time of the COVID-19 epidemic, the points raised are important and probably not specific for the EU. 
the issue of reimbursement, the need for, to develop specific regulation, legislations, guidelines to ensure good quality of telemedicine services are important. Technology-wise, there is a need to keep technical standards to ensure interoperability and user-friendly systems and tools. For a more global perspective, the report, report points to the absence of national strategy toward telemedicine development and calls for funding and gov governmental support to prioritize telemedicine in health services delivery. All this would not help if there will be no demand and acceptance of the healthcare providers and consumer toward telemedicine services. A new publication from 2020 is a systematic review of the social organization and technological factors impacting the adoption of mobile health tools by clinician. From the technology side, clinician rated usefulness, easy to use, compatibility, personalization, and convenience as the main factors that would affect the decision to adopt a mobile health tool. From the social organization side, clinician rated workflow, policy and regulation, culture, attitude, and social influence, and user engagement as the main factors to the adoption of mobile health tools. In addition to the barriers for de development and adaptation of digital health tools, we need to consider ethical issues related to the patient's benefit or loss in receiving telemedicine services and is and her right to choose a therapy and react to these satisfactory services. In a recent review on ethical and legal challenges in telemedicine, most studies reviewed emphasize the importance of informed content, oral or written before telemedicine implantation, protection of data and confidentiality um, is of course crucial. The provider has a strong responsibility for the use of the device, which must be safe, non-invasive and easy to handle. The doctors must pay the utmost attention when transmitting the patient's data to others and in the data st storage. The studies reviewed also discuss the fundamental rights of the patient and medical uh, and the issue of medical malpractice. They extended on the number of persons involved in the process, including the medical team, the system developers, the hardware vendors, and the hospital administration. Many studies indicated a solution to the damage by extending insurance coverage to cover all involved in telemedicine implementation. As discussed before, fees, financial arrangements, law, and regulation are needed while establishing the practice of telehealth. Finally, as often care is provided by medical professions from different geographical and cultural background, it is essential to have sensitivity to the local culture of patients. Going back to the paper from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2017, 5K trends that could influence the growth of telehealth care were recognized, including continuous innovation in the consumer technology market, continuous advancement in electronic health records, and clinical decision support system, projected shortages in health professional workflow, reorganization in the delivery, delivery of financing and medical care, and finally, the growth of consumerism in healthcare. All these points are valid, but at the time, no one predicted the current epidemic as a boom effect on the telehealth. And here you can see the changes that occurred in telehealth post the COVID-19 epidemic. The growth of telehealth during the epidemic is estimated to be as high as 65%, increasing in the, both in telehealth, increase of 42% in remote monitoring, and almost 30% in self-test monitoring. As you can see from this report, the changes were mainly due to increased acceptance with patients, with inpatients, improved regulatory environment, change of ruling and legislation, which simplified the process and increased acceptance with the payers. The impact of COVID-19 on patients with rare diseases was surveyed in 700 patients. We can see that the cancellation of medical appointments and challenges of accessing medical care were the main impacts of COVID-19. This can be somewhat solved with telehealth tools. The market of telehealth, as you can see here, is exponentially exceeding, and also the PubMed publication on telemedicine is general, 
and telemedicine in COVID in specific are growing all the time, as you can see um, on the bottom of, of the slide. To summarize this part of my talk, we have seen that telehealth is currently in phase of rapid growth and evolution. The combination of increasingly affordable networking, computing, and communication technology, along with the continued worldwide crisis in healthcare access and cost, has created a tipping point. As you can see here, it seems that telehealth will progress from a novel mean of practicing medicine to a practical tool to help address healthcare needs. Telehealth may also evolve beyond the means of providing care to remote communities to become a, an important tool in the delivery of healthcare in a variety of settings. And I think um, time will tell if this would be a good and um, applicable tool um, also for our patients. This recent publication summarizes the five C's that will shape the future of telehealth. As you see here, accessible care, increased convenience, enhanced comfort, greater confidentiality uh, to patients and family, and due to the COVID-19, the reduced risk of contagion. Limitation exists and should not be neglected, like inability to perform part of the physical examination, um, technology related to laboratory testing, imaging, um, inequitable access to internet and related technologies, and deliver of care of subspecialties like physiotherapists, dietitians, social workers, exercise coaches, and etc. So still work is need to be done in this area. The second topic of my talk is home therapy and LSD. Maybe times will change, but currently telehealth and telemedicine cannot deliver therapy. For the sake of social distancing, high B home therapy and even more high B self therapy is an important solution. Home therapy in LSD, as you all are aware, is not a new concept. And already in 1993, Ari Ziman and his college published the safety of home therapy in Gaucher disease. This was followed by other publications, as you can see here, and it's been discussed in previous talks. The facility to administer enzyme replacement therapy in the home limits time spent at the hospital, restoring independence and control of the disease to the patient, reduce utilization of home resources, hospital resources, and is associated with improved quality of life. On the other end, home therapy requires a well-organized and regulated community infrastructure, individual assessment of patient suitability and protocol for management of possible infusion-associated reactions. The EWGGD, the European Working Group for Gaucher Disease, has an ongoing survey on COVID-19 in patients with Gaucher disease. Here are the responses we received from 38, 39 um, centers in 19 countries. You can see in the graph the countries in reverse alphabetic orders. And you can see here that out of 19 and 20 patients with Gaucher disease, 12 cases of COVID-19 were reported. Three patients were um, sick enough to be admitted and one patient died most probably from underlying chronic disease. And you can see the calculated risk um, based on those data of uh, almost 0.6% with a 95 confident interval of 0.3% um, to 1%. How is this compared to the general risk in these countries? So this is a slide I downloaded from the, um, this website. And this is the, the current numbers for 15 of June 2020. And you see here that the calculated risk is 0.4%, which is falling in the 95% interval of the patient with Gaucher disease. So it seems, at least from this data, that there is no increased risk among patients uh, with Gaucher disease. What's more important to our topic is the use of home therapy in these countries. As you can see here in this slide, almost a third reported not to have home therapy, and the information was missing in seven clin clinics. Of the 19 countries, almost 40% do not have authorization for home therapy eight countries, um, as you can see here. Treatment interruption is shown in the other side of the slide, and it was reported by night centers, both for home therapy um, given by external personnel and for in-hospital therapy. The solution for that may be self-administration of IV therapy currently reported in some centers, in some of the patients from four centers. 
the Italian cohort published the direct and indirect effect of COVID-19 for Italian patients with nosoma storage diseases. No proved case of uh, COVID-19 was found among 102 patients patient interviewed. Um, no problems were reported by patients receiving oral treatment, and 49% of patients receiving enzyme replacement therapy in, in hospital experience, experience interruption versus only 6% of those that received home treatment. The main reasons of missing infusion in the hospital were fear of infection and reorganization of the infusion center. Um, and this caused that 16% of the patients shifted during COVID-19 to home therapy. And I think based on what uh, we have gathered and based on what we are uh, learning and uh, now in this COVID-19 epidemic, um, the EWGGD together with the IGA, the uh, International Gaucher Alliance, we are currently writing a policy paper to emphasize the safety advantage of home therapy and self-administration IV therapy. Um, and similar to what we see in telehealth, we hope that from this crisis, we will be able to influence countries and legislation against, that are currently against home therapy to change and be able to have safe IV home therapy um, for patients uh, with Gaucher disease and Gaucher disease and Lysomal disease disease worldwide, and hopefully will succeed. Finally, I would like to share with you some work in progress in digital health in Gaucher disease. This is a, the first is from a group in UK uh, in a pilot study of 21 patients that uh, utilize wearable technology to monitor physical activity as a, sur as a surrogate, um, surrogate of disease activity paired with a mobile phone app allowing patients to complete self-reported outcome measures in a real world as, op as opposed to the hospital environment. And in this study, as you can uh, see here, they were able to capture events of bone pain, sleeping problems, and other illnesses. They used different quality of life scales and demonstrated the feasibility of this approach, and they are currently increasing um, the number of the patients um, with those uh, sy systems, and I'm sure um, more data will emerge um, in time. We are planning a larger project um, with a company called Life on Key. We, we develop platforms for patients with chronic disease like, such as heart failure and diabetes. We are currently working to customize a platform for patients with Gaucher disease. Um, it's called Integra. And the Integra is built to include different components as we discussed in telehealth. Um, so one of the components is Integra Connect, Connect, as you can see here, which um, will receive input from patients with variable patient reported outcomes and data from the electronic medical records, what we called before asynchronous communication, so store and forward communication. There will be also what is called Integra Mobile, which is a, a what we call before real-time communication or synchronous communication um, by video teleconferencing visits, physician to physician communication, um, a dashboard in between visits to report in problems between uh, visits. And this platform has two other components, the Integra, Integra Brain uh, that can be used to, to create treatment rules and, and medical teams alerts and things like that. And finally, um, there is the Integra Research which can have a, a um, cumulative data analysis that can be a basis for finding trends and personal care of patients uh, with Gaucher disease. We have received a grant from uh, Sanofi Genzyme for a pilot study in our center, and we have submitted a grant to the EU Horizon 2020, uh, 2020 sorry, program for a multi-center study, and hopefully um, we'd be able to um, perform a, a border study which would give us much more um, data. I want to finish with a probe that I found to be called the Chinese probe, although I'm not sure if it's Chinese, that in every crisis lies a seed of opportunity and with the hope. And this um, gives us the hope that the, from the COVID-19 pandemic, a wealth of new digital health approaches will arise and fundamentally change and improve the care as well as research, research for individuals with chronic diseases. Um, as physicians and medical teams, we will need we will need to learn, adapt our practice to achieve the maximum benefit and minimum harm from those new technologies. Um, 
for countries and clinics that do not have the option for home therapy, I hope that the COVID-19 crisis will change this practice, enabling home therapy for most patients and improving their quality of life. Also, we should probably explore more the option of IV self-therapy. And with these pictures uh, that remind us that uh, with all these telehealth um, things, there is importance for physical contact, especially when we treat children and with a picture of our team um, in the COVID times, everybody with a mask, not so much social distancing, unfortunately. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.